Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for this place. We give you thanks for the chance that we have to come together and to think on the truth of redemption. Would you move in power by your spirit that we might see Christ more clearly and understand more deeply what you have done for us. We pray this in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Friends, something has gone terribly wrong and it desperately needs to be put right. The good news is that in Jesus, what humanity has plunged into ruin, God will redeem. Jesus' disciples have a bunch of really interesting boneheaded moments. And one of these moments happens when Jesus' disciples are arguing over who's the greatest. And in the midst of arguing over who's the greatest, Jesus unveils to his disciples his mission of redemption. The disciples are arguing over who's the greatest, and the account I'm thinking of, and that we're going to center on in one verse, uh, comes from Mark chapter 10, Mark's gospel, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Jesus says to his disciples who are arguing over who's the greatest as they try to clamor for the seat at his right, at his left, and his right in his kingdom, James and John jockeying for power. The other disciples find out and they get mad because they wanted to jockey for the power of greatness first. They're upset that they got beat to the punch. And Jesus says to his disciples, if you want to be uh, great in the eyes of the world, then you ought to think in terms of power domination, might, and control. But if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, relationship with God, living under his rule, if you want to be great in the kingdom, then you must become the servant of all. Why? Jesus then in this discussion, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he offers his answer. And he offers his answer in the form of his own mission statement. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When I was about 10 years old, uh, my uncle Harold, shout out to him, he put a choice before me, like a good uncle. He needed to train me up in the ways. And this choice that he put before me happened in the context of a movie theater. There were two movies that were big at the time, there was a Pixar movie, I can't remember which, and then there was a movie called Amistad, this historical movie about African slaves who led a revolt on a slave ship, took control, and landed in America. My uncle put before me the choice, as we're standing in the theater lobby, which movie do you want to see? I said, Uncle Harold, I got too much trauma in my life already, let's go with Pixar. He looked me in the face, he said, you're gonna see Amistad. <laughs> in my mind, I'm like, why did you even ask? I just could have dealt with the pain immediately. Why did you give me the option? And it's interesting, in this movie, there's a line when the leader of the enslaved Africans is in America and is speaking up for his people. He's picked up the language with his sharp, keen intellect and he's advocating for the liberty, for the freedom, for the release of his people. And he says in the courtroom, in front of all who are there watching and gawking, he says, give us free. Give us dignity, no more captivity. Give us free. Friends, we heard earlier today about the fall, about the reality of sin and the reality of death. We've heard about the situation of humanity. One, a situation in which humanity has fallen. Humanity is broken. Humanity is alienated from our good God and creator. Humanity is captive to sin. We do not, as humans, say, give us free. Rather, we say, God, let us be. We want nothing to do with you. This is the state of sin, and it's actually in this state of sin that God says, I will do no such thing. I will seek after you. 
I will come into this broken world. I will not abandon my image bearers who have broken my law and run from my love and my ways. I will not leave this world to decay. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is faithful even when the world is faithless. We heard this in Genesis 3, didn't we, this morning? That on the heels of sin and death entering into the world, God gave a promise of redemption. God speaking to the accuser who tempted the first humans into sin, God said this, He, this promised one, will crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. What God is saying here is that sin, death, evil, and the evil one will wound the promised one, but the promised one will be victorious. Redemption for humanity will come through a wounded healer. Redemption in the story of Scripture arrives through the promise of a person. It's not so much that we begin to go looking for God, but that God, in the great surprise and fulfillment of all Scripture, God comes looking for this lost world in a person, Jesus of Nazareth. The good news of redemption in Christianity is the news of a divine rescue, and we hear it in Jesus' mission statement amidst his disciples' beef and pettiness. For the Son of Man came. That phrase, the Son of Man came, is pointing us to the great truth that we call in theology the Incarnation. That God in Jesus Christ becomes a finite human being, come to earth to give us free. Have you come to grips with this? That into this decaying world where parents abandon children, in this decaying world where nations war against nations, in this decaying world where the strong pray against the weak, in this decaying world where death comes for us all as part of the wages of sin, into this decaying world, the God of heaven and earth has touched down, has put his feet on our soil. He's written himself into our story. He's become for our sake a vulnerable human being in order to set right all that we have broken. As the disciples are arguing over greatness, Jesus points to the greatness of redemption. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In the New Testament and in the scriptures, ransom and redemption are closely related. They're like cousins that play together all the time. Ransom and redemption. These terms are connected and they point to a buying back a setting right, a setting free. Why then does Jesus speak about his death as, and death and resurrection as a ransom or as a redemption? Well, because as we heard this morning, the Christian gospel reminds us that all of us are captive under sin and under death. And friends, all around us, not only is there captivity to sin and death, we know we're captive to sin and death because we turn to all sorts of false redeemers, false methods to try to get free. You see, friends, uh, there are false redeemers all around us, over-promising redemption and constantly under-delivering. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? All the time, these false redeemers, and they're usually good things that we try to make divine things. You see, some people say that redemption will happen through uh, these different means. Some people say that everything broken will be put right through education. But you can't lecture sin and greed out of the human heart. Some people will say everything broken will be put right through technology and progress. But don't you know that the 20th century is the most bloodiest and violent century that we've had yet? And the 21st is going to give it a run for its money. Some people will say that everything broken will be put right when people learn to act right. Don't hold your breath. These are all good things to work for, and actually the kingdom tells us to work for these things. But these good things are only band-aids if we think they can fully heal the wound inside of humanity. The redemption we need is the redemption that's deep enough to deal with the fall. We need a redemption that deals with the power and the penalty of sin and death. Because sin and death have deformed our hearts 
alienated us from God and vandalized God's good world. We need a redemption, friends, that comes from outside of us. We need a redemption that comes from God himself. And with God, friends, redemption is more than possible. Redemption is actual. How? Jesus made it clear in his mission statement. Redemption comes through his life given as a ransom. This language of Jesus in the midst of his disciples' beef, this language of Jesus brings us to the foot of a tree. This language of Jesus brings us to what in Christian terms we simply call the cross. I wonder, when's the last time, when is the last time that you stopped to really think and consider how fascinating it is that at the center of the Christian faith, Christians of old have chosen the cross as the symbol of our religion. When's the last time you really sat with that idea? We know that symbols, of course, have great power. We know that when you see the two golden arches, you think great fries and high cholesterol. We know that when you see the Nike check, you think sneakers app, John ja Morant, Kobe Bryant, Caitlin Clark, speed, status, sneakers. We know, we know that symbols convey so much so quickly. And yet for Christianity, since its early days, the symbol has been strange and bizarre. A crucified man hanging from a Roman tree. To see the cross is to see a symbol of rejection, a symbol of shame, criminality, and utter abandonment. Christians had other options. Early Christians liked the symbol of the fish, which connected Jesus' name with Greek letters. Early Christians could have chose the empty tomb. He did rise from the dead, amen? Early Christians maybe could have chose the dove, symbolizing what the Spirit coming down at Jesus' baptism. Then they could have greeted each other like this. I mean, I should have been there to advise them. So many good options. And yet the symbol for our faith was the cross. The cross is a Roman construct. The cross is a device of torment used only on slaves and vile criminals. The cross is a slow and painful public death designed to increase pain and shame so that everybody who sees you hanging there from the tree would recognize that you are less than human. In fact, you are the scum of the earth. And yet, in God's love and power, it is the cross that is the one true means of redemption offered to this fallen but beloved world. All other religions tell us to climb to God, but Jesus comes down to us. In Jesus, God enters human suffering. He suffers with us. He suffers for us. In Jesus, God goes to the lowest point, to the darkest experience of human pain in order to lift the world back up to him that we might walk in our purpose, knowing God, imaging God, worshiping God. You see, the Christian gospel says that it's only the self-giving love of God that can set right what we have set wrong. That's why our symbol is not a ladder where we climb back to God to have peace with him, but rather our symbol is a Roman cross where humanity did their worst against God and God in his love overcame the darkness of our sin in order to rescue us. Isn't it marvelous that out of the soil of this beautiful and yet broken world grew a tree? And this tree was then taken, stripped of its bark, Human image bearers used their minds to technologically mold this tree into a refined tool of execution designed to degrade. And then human beings took the Son of God who came among them and nailed him to this tree. But by the power of God's self-giving love, this tree designed for death became the new tree of life. Jesus was no passive victim. He willingly gave himself over to this tree. He wanted to take death for our sake. And by his wounds through faith in him, we are forgiven and restored to life with God now 
and in the age to come. Jesus gives us this mission statement, but he doesn't unpack all of the details of how, the, how this works. The rest of the New Testament does. I'll point just to one place where this reality, this redemption through the tree of the cross is fleshed out. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him, Jesus, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. Preachers, I don't know if you know this, preachers have a secret ability in which at certain critical points of a message, we can read people's minds. And I know right now, some of you in this large, dark room, this blinding room, uh, some of you are thinking, isn't this a little bit intense? Jesus suffered this brutal death to forgive sins and usher in the kingdom of God. Why did redemption require something so extreme? Well, the seriousness of the cross shows us the seriousness of the fall, which also then shows us the scandalous depth of God's love. Remember how serious the fall is. We brought rebellion against God and death into this world. Remember that sin, because God is holy and just, sin occurs a penalty for our rebellion against God. Remember that forgiveness always comes at a cost to someone in some way. This is why the cross happens in God's love to overcome our sin. I love the way the old theologian John Stott explains the nature of the cross. In this way, he says, the essence of sin is humanity substituting themselves for God. The essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Isn't this what Jesus said? The son of man will give himself as a ransom for many. Friends, the sin of the world, my sin, your sin is great, but the mercy of God through that tree is greater. All of sin's penalty, all of death's power in rage, all that should be laid upon us for all of our wayward ways and rebellion against God, failure to love God and neighbor with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, all that we have incurred has been laid upon him. He's absorbed it all, he's taken it. And in exchange, we're given his perfect life, his full forgiveness and reconciliation with the God who made us. Yes, friends, this redemption is actual, and it comes at a cost, the cost of Christ's own blood. You can see this in the title that he gives. He says, I'm the Son of Man. The Son of Man is Jesus combining two themes from the Scriptures, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and the eschatological ruler of Daniel 7. He's combining them in such a way but he's combining something that ought to shock us because this son of man ought to be ruling in power, not dying in humility. But this is the depth of the love of God, that he goes to the Roman tree. The almighty high God comes low in order to lift us back up. I love the way uh, the old Christians talked about this stuff. I love the way the Bishop uh, Melito from the second century describes this. Listen to this language talking about the price of redemption paid by the Son of Man. He says that he that hung up the earth in space was himself hanged up. He that fixed the heavens was fixed with nails. He that bore up the earth was borne up on a tree. The Lord of all was subject to death. To redeem is to set loose. To redeem is to rescue. And that is exactly what Christ has done. Redemption comes at a price, the blood of our Savior. You see, by his blood, we are rescued from the penalty of sin, for God the judge was judged in our place. By his blood, we are rescued from the power of sin, for in his death and his resurrection, we've been set free to know God and to walk in his purposes. By his blood, we're set free from spiritual blindness so that we can live in the newness of life restored to God, who renews his image in us, that we might live in his kingdom ways. Friends, you probably don't need to look far into your own narrative to know your need for redemption, your need for healing, your need for forgiveness, your need for your talents to be redeemed and repurposed and redirected toward God and his ways of his kingdom. The redemption you are looking for is not found anywhere but in Christ his cross, and his resurrection. His cross is that which brings us into his kingdom, knowing God and serving the world in his name. Don't ever let somebody pull you away from the cross 
of Jesus Christ. There's a scene in a novel that I love called The Samurai by the Japanese writer Shusasuko Endo. And in this novel, the main character, a low-ranking samurai from a no-name village, continues to see images of Jesus on the cross. And he's so um, angry and confused and scandalized by what he calls this emaciated and weak, disfigured man. He continues to wonder, why do all these Christians, why do they worship this man of weakness, this man of failure, this man who died in such a degrading way? Until eventually, at the end of the novel, he sees the man on the cross and he realizes that this man came low in order to get near to me. You see, what a disciple of Jesus is, is many things. But a disciple of Jesus, in one sense, is the person who sees the cross, which the world says is folly, foolishness, unsophisticated. A disciple of Jesus is one who sees the cross of our Savior and says, that's my Redeemer. That's my hope. That's my new life. That's the place of my redemption. I have to quote the great gospel preacher, Timothy Keller, who describes the power of redemption through the cross in this way. He says that the gospel says that you are worse than you know. That's the fall. But you are more loved by God than you can ever imagine. That's redemption. How do we know this is true? Through the victory of the Son of Man who gave himself on the cross to conquer our enemies, sin, Satan, death, and evil. This is how we are set right with God, but this is also how God is going to renew and remake the world. Just as sin in the fall touches every inch of our being and every inch of the cosmos, so too does redemption touch every inch of our being and every inch of God's creation. The cross and the resurrection touches souls and solar systems, individuals and creation itself. Paul describes this in Colossians 1. Through Jesus, God is reconciling all things. Can you say all things? all things? He is reconciling all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace, listen to this, by the blood of his cross. Friends, the cross and the resurrection is where Jesus went to war with our sin, but also the evil one. It's where Jesus went to battle with the powers of evil and the forces of darkness and death. And he conquered them by giving himself up to them. And he triumphed over them because you cannot put life to death for long. And when Christ returns to establish his kingdom in full, the redemption won on the cross will be fully realized into every inch of this universe. Our sin, our evil, our greed will give way to the full shalom of God. I heard a story recently about a Turkish boy who was spending time with a missionary. This Turkish boy had no exposure to the gospel, no exposure to the Christian faith. The missionary had really not had the chance to unpack much of, uh, about the gospel uh, to, to this young boy. But one day the young boy came to the missionary and said, I had a dream last night. The man said, what was the dream about? The boy said, I drew a picture. The boy reaches and grabs the picture and he hands it to the man, to the missionary. The boy says, I had a dream and I saw the man who will end every war. He had drawn a picture of a man hanging on a cross. The cross is a tree of life for the world. In fact, the Bible communicates this. We see the tree of life in Genesis 3, in sin. We see the tree upon which Jesus dies depicted in the gospel. And the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, declares the same truth that this boy saw in his dream. When the new heavens and the new earth described, yes, John Mark Comer is right, we do go from a garden to a city, but within that city, there's also some trees. So maybe he should have called the book Garden City Garden. Sorry. The end of the book ends. The end of the story ends in the city. But there's a garden there too because the tree of life still stands. This is Revelation 22. There was the tree of life with 12 kinds of fruit, each yielding its fruit each month. And listen to this. 
The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Jesus, the Son of Man, is the new Adam who leads us into the new Eden, back to life with God through the tree of life that is his cross and climaxes in the resurrection. It heals not only individual sinners, but the whole cosmos. Ending war forever, putting death to death, because Jesus, when he died, went inside of death, disarmed it from the inside, so that for us, death becomes just a, not, not a period, but rather a comma into eternal life. This is what Jesus has come to do. So friends, I hope you know that Jesus is our Redeemer. And I hope you know that through him, who you are, through him and his redemption on the tree of life, you become a new creation. You become one whose eyes are open to God. You become one who is adopted into God's new family and new kingdom. You become one who was once cut off from God, but is now brought near by the riches of God's grace. You become one whose heart is made new by the Holy Spirit to walk in the newness of life. Friends, you might think that such a redemption that brings you into a relationship with God and into his kingdom, you might think that because of such a great redemption, the kingdom of God only accepts the best of candidates, the finest of applicants. If that's what you thought, then you would be joyfully wrong. This salvation, this redemption is an unearned gift of God given to the world through grace. We receive it by faith, by trust in the one who gave himself for us. Friends, Jesus has come to give us free. He gave his life and he rose again for the many. And friends, you are among them. So know this, redemption has a name, Jesus. Redemption has a means, his life, his death, his resurrection. And redemption is extended to you, but not only to you, to all the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. Help us to grasp the height and the depth of your love and your saving power. Lord, open our eyes to behold the scope of redemption you offer. Lord, help us to not believe any of the lies that say our sins are too great for your mercy. Help us by the power of your spirit to see and to walk in the truth of your gospel. We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.